Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time of day it is for you. My name is Gabriel Coder, and I'm here today to teach you a little bit about conflict and conflict resolution. Now, without further ado, let's get right into it. All right, so I suppose an introduction is in order. I'm 20 years old. I'm a graduate of the Human Resources Program here at Durham College, and I'm also enrolled in the Mediation Alternative Dispute Resolution Program here at Durham. In my current mediation program, one of my courses is called CCRS, that's Campus Conflict Resolution Services, where myself and my peers provide information, lessons, conflict coaching, and even mediation services to both staff and students at Durham College. If you or anyone you know is going through a serious conflict right now and needs help, support, advice, coaching, or even a full-blown mediation, please get in contact with us. You can reach us here by our email at ccrs at durhamcollege.ca. And if you wish to contact me personally for further questions, advice, anything of the sort, my email is gabriel.coder at durhamcollege.ca. Now that's out of the way, let's go into the itinerary for today. All right, so we're going to begin by defining conflict to gain a better understanding of the word. After all, we are going to be saying it a lot today. Then we'll move into defining and discussing conflict resolution, followed by defining and discussing the five conflict styles. And after that, I'll talk about why conflict resolution and de-escalation matter. We'll touch on the four ways of communication. I'll provide some tips on conflict from my program and some techniques that you can use yourself when in conflict. All right, so I'll start by saying that conflict isn't easy to define. What even is conflict? Most people have a generally negative outlook on conflict, but as we're taught in the Alternative Dispute Resolution Program, conflict isn't necessarily always negative and can sometimes be beneficial. In addition, conflict can be very big or very small. On the large end of the spectrum, conflict can mean outright war between countries, and these large-scale conflicts often arise from differences in politics, culture, religion, and many more reasons. On the small end of the spectrum, you could have two toddlers fighting over the same toy. They both want to play with the little dinky car they have, and Heather's willing to bunch. So we'll ask the question for anyone who's listening. How do you define conflict? What's the first word that comes to mind when you think conflict? Now, since you can't actually speak to me here with this asynchronous video, I ask that you simply comment below, when I think of conflict, I think blank. I know most of you aren't going to do so, but it's a good way for me to see if you're really listening. Also, don't worry about being right or wrong. There isn't really a wrong answer. I just want to hear what you have to say. Thanks in advance for your answers. So, conflict as defined by the dictionary is as follows. From Merriam-Webster, Mental struggle resulting from incompatible or opposing needs, strives, wishes, or external or internal demands. And from Cambridge, An act of disagreement between people with opposing opinions or principles. Now, while these are pretty de decent definitions of conflict, who's to say either are the perfect definition? Everyone defines conflict differently because conflict is defined by your experiences with it, and everyone has their own unique experiences in conflict. I like to give my definition of conflict to provide a comparison. When two or more people or opposing parties have differing and often clashing ideas, principles, and or interests. Now, once again, this isn't the perfect definition of conflict. There is no perfect definition of conflict. But I hope you've at least gained some understanding about what exactly conflict means. And the truth is about conflict, that it isn't always bad. It's not an inherently negative thing, although it often can be, of course. Conflict can be helpful or even beneficial at times to either party. We'll get into that more on win-wins and win-lose situations later on, but for now, let's move on. I'm going to try to define conflict resolution here, but be warned, it isn't easy. Conflict resolution is a social situation where the armed conflicting parties in an agreement resolve to live peacefully with and or dissolve their basic incompatibilities and henceforth cease to use arms against one another. Now, is it just me or does that not make any sense? See, that's the problem with defining conflict resolution. It isn't easy to define. But despite that, conflict resolution matters. Now, Conflict resolution is somewhat intuitive, and it's also not easy to define, and it can be taught, but for some it's intuitively known. I found personally that I was always good at it. And you can practice it and refine your skills with it, but once again, some people instinctively know how to do it. Now, the reason why it matters is because conflict is inevitable. Throughout your life, you're constantly having conflict, and you constantly will be having conflict. It's an everyday part of your life. 
Conflict happens in school, and it's a part of business. No matter where you work, no matter where you go to school, you will find conflict, and it will find you. Whether you're on the job, in your personal life, with your friends, conflict resolution is incredibly important. You've already been in countless conflicts, and you're going to be in countless more throughout your life and career. Conflict resolution is just a skill that you need to master. No matter your career path, conflict resolution matters. Now I'm going to get into what I call the three traits slide. All right, so we have patience, ability to remain calm, and language and word choice. These are the three traits for conflict resolution and de-escalation. I'll start off with patience. Patience is very rewarding in conflict. By carefully choosing when to speak or act, you gain an advantage over the other party. I often try very hard to be more patient in conflict when dealing with those who aren't acting very rationally. This is especially useful for when dealing with children, those who aren't in a rational mental state, and those who are going through a crisis. You must be patient with people when in conflict, and you shouldn't be rash with the decision making. You should find the perfect timing to decide your course of action and make sure it's the best action that you can take. An example, once again, is when someone's not acting rationally. Say somebody's not in a good mental state or having a mental breakdown. You should be very patient with how you're treating them, especially during times like that. Next up, ability to remain calm. It's incredibly important, yet rarely mentioned. A calm voice in combination with the others can pacify people, but not everyone can stay calm, especially under pressure. However, this can be learned. An example for when remaining calm is most useful is for when whoever is in conflict is very agitated or even becoming violent. When you speak softly, calmly, directly, and objectively, you can reflect this onto the other person. On a psychological level, it's hard to stay mad at somebody who's completely calm, rational, and objective in what they're saying. And by objective, I mean telling the truth very directly and rationally. Then we have language slash word choice. Your words matter immensely in a conflict. Everything you say can create a positive or negative reaction from the other party. And in order to prevent further escalation, you should avoid blaming, name-calling, and engaging in toxic or petty behavior. It's just not very effective. Now, an example for when word choice is good is when you're faced with someone who's purposely attempting to agitate you. They want you to portray yourself negatively so they can point it out as proof that you're a bad person. But by actively considering your word choice and not falling into such a trap, you completely avoid feeding fuel onto the fire that is the conflict itself. And when combined, all three of these traits are incredibly powerful in preventing conflict. Just remember, be patient, stay calm, and choose your words wisely. Okay, so now I'm going to get into the five conflict styles that were taught in my program. And these styles are as follows. Accommodation, avoidance, collaboration, competition, and compromising. So each of these styles have a time and a place to use them, and they'll be important in your jobs and personal life too. However, most people find that they already frequently use one of these styles in conflict. Usually people tend to stick to one style that they prefer and tend to rarely use the others. But I think that in order to be truly successful in conflict resolution, you need to know about when to use all five. All right, so I'm going to start getting into each style one by one and tackle them, giving them a Brief description of them. So first off is accommodation. Accommodation is useful when you value the relationship of the individual who is in conflict with you. You want to help them and you're willing to give them what they want if it means keeping your relationship well intact and them happy. I can foresee this style being most useful when you're talking down someone in crisis or attempting to make them feel safer by telling them things they want to hear and promising them things to help them calm down. Accommodation is a lose-win with you losing. Next up, avoidance. Avoidance is where, in order to prevent or de-escalate conflict, you simply actively avoid it. This could mean leaving the scene of the conflict or ignoring someone who's provoking you. An example could be when one isn't being provoked by a person who intentionally wants you to fight back, and avoiding the conflict here is the best option because giving in only makes them happy. Avoidance isn't necessarily a win or lose scenario for anyone, but by avoiding you may prevent yourself from losing something and vice versa. Next up, collaboration. Collaboration is when two parties choose to work together in a conflict for mutual gain. Collaboration is likely the style you will use in group projects both in school and on the job. It's very important for times where you need help solving a problem and you can't do it on your own. Collaboration is one of the best conflict styles because it allows for a true win-win. 
However, the biggest issue with collaboration is honestly just the time it takes to set it up. Agreeing upon collaborating in the first place doesn't always happen in times of conflict, and agreeing upon rules and other various things takes time. If you don't have time, you may just choose competition instead. Speaking of, competition is when one party seeks to gain everything for themselves in a true win-lose. Competition is useful in scenarios where you need to achieve something, and it doesn't matter what it takes. For instance, if there's a fire and people are arguing over what action to take, competition is useful in that you could just say, there's no time to argue, we need to get out of here right now. Competition is a win-lose, but the one competing, winning. You may also use competition in times where you're trying to get a promotion or proving yourself in a physical strength test. Next up, compromising. Compromising is when each party gives and takes in order to create a win-win. Compromising is useful when you want to make sure both parties get something out of the situation and are at least somewhat satisfied. But the problem with compromising is that both parties win a little and lose a little, which isn't necessarily the best option for either party. The best example I was ever given was by one of my professors, and it's the orange example. So two siblings are fighting over an orange. They both want it and neither are willing to budge. Their mother takes the orange and splits it in half, giving each child half of the orange. The problem is, now neither child is satisfied. You see, the mother didn't stop to ask why each child wanted the orange. She assumed their interests. In reality, the first child wanted the orange only for its peels, so they could use it for baking. Whereas the second child wanted the orange in whole because they were very hungry. So you see, compromising doesn't always give both parties what they really want. Alright, so now I'm going to touch on the four ways of communication, but I don't want to spend too much time on this topic. I still think it's important to understand communication, though, as it does heavily impact and relate to conflict resolution. So firstly, we have nonverbal. Now, nonverbal is actually a very powerful form of expressing yourself, and although not nearly as direct as the others, it makes a huge difference. From eye contact to body posture to smiling and other gestures, nonverbal communication is very good at showing how somebody truly feels. It's the most expressive way to communicate, and that's also why emojis exist, to try and bridge that nonverbal gap that's lacking in text. It's important to recognize the role of nonverbal communication in conflict resolution, as recognizing through body language when someone isn't quite right or maybe nervous can help you to conduct yourself in a manner that better suits the other party. Verbal is obviously just speaking. It's the most direct form of communication, and were we not living in a digital age in COVID times, I would say it's the most common form of communication. However, I'm not quite sure that's true anymore. Our next topic may have superseded that. Despite that, verbal is incredibly important in conflict resolution because it is simply the most common communication when face-to-face -face with people. And since most conflicts are face-to-face, -face, it's absolutely vital to conflict resolution. Written communication. Whether it's on a piece of paper, displayed on a computer screen, or a text on your phone, written communication is a, a very powerful communication method. Now, when it comes to conflict resolution, I wouldn't say it's nearly as linked as verbal or nonverbal, but it is still very important. And of course, there's going to be written communication in conflict and conflict resolution. Sometimes a conflict can start from what's written on a piece of paper or what was emailed to you or sent by text, or perhaps what someone comments on your recent Instagram post. An angry or rude email can sour a mood or even cause an argument which leads to a conflict. Since emails are an integral part of business life, it's very important that you learn to be careful with it and what you say and how you say it. Paraverbal is an interesting one. I wonder if anybody even knows what it means. Well, paraverbal is the tone, pacing, pitch, inflection, and pauses one does during speech. All these things together can completely change a message's meaning. Sarcasm is a big example of this. If someone's being sarcastic and rude to you in an effort to bait you into being provoked, it might be useful to remember the avoidance conflict style. Everything changes when you use paraverbal communication. It's important to take note of it when dealing with a conflict. It could easily change certain details. All right, so for this next section, I'm going to be giving some tips on conflict resolution that I got from an excellent book, which I highly recommend all of you read in your own spare time. And I will include a link to the concise PDF version of this in the description of this video. And if I don't, please comment and remind me. <laughs> so anyways, this book is called Getting Past No, Negotiating in Difficult Situations, and is written by William Urey. In his book, there is a lengthy section on different techniques to use in conflict or negotiation scenarios. Listed here are those techniques. Don't react, go to the balcony. Don't argue, step to their side. Don't push, 
build them a golden bridge. Don't reject, reframe. Don't escalate, use power to educate. And turning adversaries into partners. Now, all these techniques are excellent, but for the sake of both time and everyone's attention span, I will not be covering all these techniques in great detail. In the following slides, I have selected what I think are the three most important of these techniques, and I'll explain a little bit about them. All of these can be applied in your daily lives in times of negotiation or conflict. All right, let's start with don't react, go to the balcony. So this concept is meant to demonstrate what to do when faced with provocations or dirty tricks. Now, dirty tricks are a separate concept that I don't feel are necessary to delve into in great depth today, but in brief, dirty, dirty tricks are tactics that people use in negotiations to gain leverage over the other person. Let's say you're in negotiations with someone or in conflict with them and negotiating the conflict. The other party says something specifically to get a reaction out of you, perhaps a threat or some form of intimidation or attack. Any of these are with the intention of making you uncomfortable. Now, the absolute worst thing that you can do in this scenario is attack them back. Instead, take a moment to step back, collect your thoughts, and try to view the situation objectively. In addition, it's good to know your own hot buttons, meaning knowing specifically what triggers you, why it triggers you, and how to avoid reacting when triggered in conflict or negotiation. Real quick, here's some ways you can pause and take some time to think. So the first one is pause and say nothing. Quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to act. You don't need to respond immediately to everything. Taking a moment to think objectively and collect yourself is incredibly useful. Think back to earlier when I spoke about how important patience is in conflict. Rewind the tape. Repeat what you heard, neutralize the impact. By repeating back to the other party what you heard, both parties gain clarity and understanding. In addition, if an attack or threat was made, it makes it very clear to both parties what that threat was. This may cause the other party to reflect on what they said or did, hopefully in a positive manner. Take a time out. Call a caucus or discuss a new offering. And a caucus, for those that don't know, is a meeting called to stop the current negotiation or mediation and take a moment to reflect and think on what's happened. Now, although very applicable to formal mediation or negotiations, you can't just take a time out in all conflict scenarios. So I say keep this one in mind for the right situation in life. Don't make important decisions on the spot. Oftentimes, the other party wants you to be angry, upset, and emotional so that your emotions will cloud your judgment and lead you to make decisions that favor them. So you shouldn't do that, obviously. You should try to avoid that. You should try to make sure you're not reacting and going to the balcony if you have to. Okay, now I hope my explanations of these tactics so far have been clear enough, and I say it's time to move on to the next section. Don't argue, step to their side. This concept is all about defusing hostility and calming the other party, and is by far the most applicable in real-world scenarios, not just negotiations. When someone is getting upset and starting to become hostile to you, oftentimes the best way to resolve the conflict or situation is not to become competitive and not becoming hostile back, but acknowledging their points, listening carefully, demonstrating your active listening, but most importantly, expressing your views without provoking. For example, one time my older brother came to me incredibly aggravated and started yelling in my face over something he was upset over me doing. Instead of reacting and getting upset with him, I listened to what he had to say. I acknowledged the truth in his words, I agreed on things that he said that were truthful, and finally, without provoking him further, I expressed my own views on the conflict. Combine this technique with the three tactics I mentioned earlier, being patient, calm, and choosing your words wisely, and you will be very successful. In the end, my brother could not stay aggravated at me for long, and he calmed down. We resolved the conflict peacefully and moved on with our day. Moving on to our final section before the conclusion... Don't reject, reframe. In times of conflict, people will have two things, positions and interests. Positions are often expressed by the parties, openly. Things like, I want you to do this, and I want it at this time. However, on the other flip side, interests are under the surface, hidden in conflict. Interests would be like, I want this done by this time because my boss is putting under a lot of pressure on me, and I need to get it done, and I don't want to be reprimanded. In times of negotiation and conflict, positions are not what you want, 
You want to hear the interests, and in order to get to those interests, you need to not reject positions, but reframe them. You should be actively trying to reframe the other person's arguments, redirecting them from their positions and attempting to identify their interests. You should try to invent creative solutions and discuss fair standards for negotiations. You should try to ask problem-solving questions of them. Things like, why? Why not? What if? You could even ask for advice or ask why something is fair and make sure that anything you ask is open-ended. All input you see from the other party should be bounced back at them through a combination of paraphrasing and reframing. The last important thing to note here is on some reframing tactics. So, this could be something like deflecting attacks and trying to reframe them as an attack on the problem, focusing not on the people, but the problem. Another tactic is to focus on going around stone walls. Sometimes the other party will try to put down a stone wall, figuratively of course, stopping the conversation and creating an impasse. They're trying to block things and cut off the conflict. Now there are three ways to beat this tactic. You can either ignore it, reinterpret it, or test it. And if anyone has any questions on this, or if you don't quite get anything I said in any of these sections, please leave a comment below or send me an email. I promise I will get back to you with an answer. Well, everyone, I hope you've had fun today, and I hope you learned something new. We've covered a lot of content today, and I worry I maybe even covered too much. But regardless, I do hope it was enjoyable. I want to thank Mrs. Key for giving me this opportunity to teach you all, and I really do appreciate it. With that, thank you very much for watching, and have a wonderful rest of your day.